This video is brought to you by the Paddington Survivors Group, bringing awareness to the survivors of the Paddington train collision and other accidents across the globe, and sharing their stories. Paddington Station, a commuter train departs, an express train comes in, and they're on a collision course. This is the tragic tale of the Paddington train collision also known as the Ladbroke train crash. On October 5th, 1999, at 7.30, the 603 First Great Western Express from Cheltenham is making its way to Paddington. The train consisted of eight Mark III coaches with two Class 43s on each end, with 43.011 leading and 43.018 trailing. 52-year-old driver Brian Cooper is in 43011's cab and has been with the railway for more than 30 years. He made his last stop before Paddington at Reading, 56 miles from London, not too long ago. Meanwhile, a Thames Trains commuter train bound for Bedwin left Platform 9 at Paddington Station. The train consisted of a three-car Turbo Class 165 diesel multiple unit set, or DMU for short with set 165-115 making up the train, with cars 58967 as the leader, 55429 in the middle, and 58930 as the rear car. Its driver was 31-year-old Michael Hodder, who was promoted to driver weeks before. After departing Paddington, Hodder has quite a challenge. He has to cross over three different tracks in order to get to the right one since 50 trains go in and out of Paddington every hour. To make matters worse, the morning sun is hanging low, glaring behind his train. This factor will prove critical to the investigation later. The turbo passes under signal SM109 at 65 kilometers an hour, or 40 miles an hour, which appears to be double amber. He then accelerates through the signal until... The two trains collide head-on at a combined speed of 210 kilometers an hour at Ladbroke Grove. Power car 43011 ricochets upward off the turbo, causing the turbo to collide dead center on the first coach of the inner city, resulting in major injuries and death to the occupants of both cars. The middle and rear cars of the turbo were thrown 12 meters backward off the track and onto their side and the middle car's fuel tank ruptures, turning the crash site into a hell-like inferno. The Mark III coach is near the middle of the train jackknife and pile onto the wreckage. A second fireball erupts, this time in most of the inner city cars, as the lead power car's fuel tank was ripped from its frame and skidded down the track before igniting. It is thought that the down power lines of the overhead catenary were contributing factors to the fireballs. 31 people are dead, including both drivers, 523 are injured, mainly suffering second and third degree burns. It is the deadliest crash on British rail in over a decade, and the worst Great Western wreck since the South All collision two years prior. What could have caused such a catastrophe? Did it share similarities with South All? Investigators from the Health and Safety Committee discovered very intriguing factors. To start off, SN109 wasn't amber at all. It was red. So why did the driver of the turbo set not stop? Investigators ruled out suicide, sabotage, among other factors. So what could have happened? Well, the sun was glaring toward the signal, so there was only one factor left. It's called 
phantom signal, where something like a sun glare can create a false signal reading to the engineer, making him think it was amber, not red. To add insult to injury, Paddington interlocking is quite crowded with overhead wires, signal bridges, wire bridges, among other stuff, making the area quite cluttered and making SM-109 hard to spot. SM-109's design was also quite strange. Most signals on British Rail are four light signals with all four lights stacked vertical. SM-109, however, was different. It was in a backwards L shape with the red signal not being in the vertical set, but offset in the L. As the turbo set passed by the signal, investigators concluded the engineer just couldn't see the signal properly, thinking it was a yellow or double yellow, when in reality it was red. But wasn't there a safety system to prevent this that had been in service since 1958? Well, there was. It's called AWS, or Automatic Warning System. It's a magnetic system that alerts drivers to any signal aspect. If the signal is green, a chime is heard. Any other aspect causes a horn to sound in the cab, and if the engineer does not acknowledge the warning, the emergency brakes are applied. AWS was functional in the turbo set, and the turbo driver did indeed acknowledge the warning. However, AWS had a major design flaw. It couldn't verify the difference between red signals and amber signals. So once the turbo set passed the red signal, disaster was inevitable. But there was still one more barrier that could have saved lives. Signalers who were monitoring the train's movements noticed the driver of the turbo set passed the red signal. They weren't worried at first. It sometimes happens and thought AWS would stop him but it didn't. So they sent a warning to him telling him to stop. But it's possible that the turbo set either didn't notice the warning or did not get it in time. So the signalman, hoping to reduce the severity of the crash, throw SM120, another signal ahead of the inner city 125, to red instead of green to try and get the inner city to start braking to reduce the severity of the crash. But they set it red 18 seconds later, too late to slow down the inner city, leaving the signalers having to watch helplessly as the collision took place the way it did. Signalers, however, were criticized for their actions as precious seconds ticked by before they reacted accordingly to the disaster and the warning both trains of the danger. In the end, power car 43011, turbo cars 58967 and 55429 were scrapped. 58930 was likely used as a part source or as a spare car. The SM109 signal was replaced with a newer design to make it more visible. Thames Trains was fined a record 2 million pounds after admitting violations of the health and safety law in connection with the accident in order to pay 75,000 pounds in legal costs. Network Rail, who owned the signal, was fined 4 million pounds on the 30th of March 2007 in order to pay 225,000 pounds in legal costs as they pleaded guilty to charges under the Health and Safety Work Act 1974 in relation to the accident. A memorial garden had been created a memorial garden had been created, partially overlooking the site, accessible from a supermarket car park. Pam Warren wrote the book, From Behind the Mask, which narrates her experiences during the crash, her recovery, and how it affected her life and relationships. The online group Paddington Survivors Group was established as a community site showing awareness to the survivors of the Paddington train collision and survivors of other accidents across the globe. Twenty years have gone by since this tragedy, but it's hopeful something like this is never seen again. I wanted a carriage where mobile phones are banned. And I wanted one where I could play and make as much noise as I liked. I wanted the kind of first-class service I get from an airline. I just wanted a helping hand.